but we're trying to engage voters in every possible way we can. And Dave, we're just so excited you're willing to be our, our, our test candidate. <laughs> hey, that's, we, that's great. As we figure this out. But I think we are a little after four o'clock and there might be a few more people joining us. We know that Anne has uh, four people in her apartment watching uh -huh. on her TV with the computer handy so they can ask questions as we move along. But with that, I'm going to go in and uh, do the formal welcome. We just, again, Dave, we are so grateful you accepted our invitation uh, for the last few election cycles uh, through Joan Whitman and the Legislative Advocacy Partners and Crondelet Village. That we have joined up with the Justice Office to host what we call candidate circle conversations. We purposely set this up that we do not want to debate. So we, we give every candidate on the ballot an option to accept the invitation. And Dave was the first one on this election cycle. And we really just want to have a conversation. It's a chance to get to know folks. Um, we are leaving the microphones open so that we can have a conversation. And we, um, in the spirit of the Sisters of St. Joseph and Consociates, um, this is a conversation in, in, in the uh, truest form. And uh, so anyone can kind of ask a question. You can physically wave your hand or raise your hand on the computer. You can turn on your camera and uh, uh, interact with Dave, but uh, we'll just kind of go around and have a conversation to get to know our candidate. We'll give Dave a chance to begin with the very basic question of tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and why you continue to run for uh, the Minnesota House seat for District 64B. And then at the end, after the conversation, we'll give Dave a chance to give his elevator speech on why we should vote for him as a candidate um, at the very end. But again, we, we want to just start with a conversation. So again, welcome Dave and, and all the folks who are joining us today, uh, both on Zoom uh, and uh, through the video and at the broadcast at the village. But thank you, Dave, for accepting our invitation and tell us why you are running for another term of as a House of Representative for 64B this time. Yeah, good. Uh, thank you, Marty, and thanks everybody. It's so good to see so many friends. Um, I'm definitely um, uh, starting with Joan Whitman, um, who's been a, a friend and mentor and um, and so good to see her and so good to see everybody else too. Um, so I'm um, so Dave Pinto, P-I-N-T-O. Um, so I live just about a mile east of Crondelet, live um, Snelling and Randolph um, uh, with my, my wife and two uh, boys who are in the St. Paul Public Schools. And so, yeah, so I'm running for re-election to what will be, it's kind of amazing to think, and Joan, you might be amazed to think about this, to my fourth term, Minnesota House, I've served three terms um, so far. Um, and I, um, let me think, I work as a prosecutor outside the legislature. I specialize in, um, especially in gender violence issues and domestic assault and sexual exploitation um, and sex trafficking. So some pretty heavy things. And so I bring um, that experience to my work at the Capitol and trying to stand up for vulnerable people. And so I focused a lot on um, public safety and criminal justice issues. I'm the author of the, um, the bill to um, require uh, criminal background checks on uh, gun sales. Um, and then the other big thing that I focused a lot on is, um, is on making sure that little kids get off to a great start um, and that I feel like that's something that can make a difference for, our, for all of us um, in our society. So those are a couple of issues I focused on. And, um, and I feel like uh, um, as I've been getting to know the job better over the last couple of terms and having, um, uh, uh, I feel like there's a lot more opportunities to really make a difference um, for folks. And I guess I'm especially excited by the prospect this next term of working with Governor Walls, um, working potentially with a, um, a DFL Senate, we'll, we'll see, um, but really building on the work we've done so far to try to have a state where everybody can can contribute and thrive. And I'm sure we'll get plenty of chance to talk about that, but that's the basic sense of things. I'm so happy to be with you all. I guess I probably should note just one final thing that I feel a real special connection to Crowdlet having so many friends um, there. I come out of a Catholic social justice background myself. Um, that's really important to me. And, um, and so feel a real closeness to you all and to the um, institution you're a part of. And so glad to be with you today. So thanks. And for our Katie's and Katie professors or folks connected with St. Catherine's, Dave has a, a long connection with St. Kate's as well. And his current 
campaign manager, I believe, is uh, Katie. And with that, I know, Joan, you had a question you wanted to start us off with uh, to begin the conversation with Dave Pinto today. Well, Dave, before I ask the question I had in mind, I guess I'd like you to talk more about what you have done around early childhood. I, I just say that because it's, it's been extremely impressive and the fact that you got legislation passed right during this last session, which has been so, so precarious. So would Thank you talk about that there's a lot of educators in this group? And yeah, no, thank Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you, Joan. And actually, I, I'm, uh, I'm worried that I'll forget this. I want to make sure just to set the stage because it's a really noteworthy point that Minnesota has the only divided legislature in the country. So the only legislature, there is one unicameral legislature where there's one, only one uh, chamber in that state, state of Nebraska. Um, but otherwise, we're the only state that has a Democratic chamber and a Republican chamber. So we really do have to be working together um, and to, to figuring out paths forward. And I, I'm really proud of, of some of that work um, for early childhood and other, other areas as well. So um, yeah, this has been a focus of mine since the very beginning. I'm feeling like that um, if we can get kids off to a great start, that that benefits not only themselves and their families, but it really benefits all of us. If you think about the people, even uh, caregivers in the nursing home at um, uh, in your facility, right? Um, they, they started off as little kids and we want to make sure that everybody when they're a little kid and as they grow up, that they're in a position to be providing care for others, to be living out their best potential. And that's what is involved in making sure in those first couple of years of life. Um, so I've had a real focus on that. So I actually founded um, a, a policy forum that's held quarterly uh, in partnership with the School of Social Work, uh, formerly at St. Kate's and St. Thomas. There've been some organizational changes, but it's a real partnership um, that's been there. And that's been something I've pushed all the way along to bring together advocates and others. So we've had that, um, I founded that policy forum in 2016. It's been going for four years now. And out of that forum then, there have been a series of proposals um, to help make sure um, that families have support for childcare for, because we do have a lot of um, parents who are in the workforce. And then to make sure that there's early learning going on, not only in preschool, but even before then, um, of course, age appropriate, but we know that babies and infants and toddlers learn so much just from the relationships with their caregivers. Um, so that's been a big focus of mine. Um, I could go off on all sorts of pieces and certainly glad to, but yeah, um, uh, there's been quite, quite a lot of that and that's been a major focus. It's a challenging area because it's not one that we've really focused on before, but now we really know the potential. Can you speak just a little bit about what legislation was passed? Yeah, sure. So what specifically was passed in this divided legislature, um, probably the most important thing was that, and it's going to get a little bit in the weeds, everybody, but I'll try to not be too much. We have a child care assistance program. So it helps families uh, who are working to be able to afford um, their child care. And um, our state, for various reasons, um, has gotten far out of um out of whack, for lack of a better term, compared to the rest of the country and the rates that are paid to providers. So the way that it works is if you are caring for little kids, you're doing that really crucial work for society, the rate you get paid is set at a survey that was taken almost 10 years ago. And then we go down to the 25th percentile of that survey and that's the rate you get paid. So imagine trying to live on that and trying to do that work and already your rates were super low to begin with. So the legislation that passed increases rates to be at the current survey at the very least and to increase those rates. I wish we could do them more, but there's quite a jump and I'm really proud to have worked with the Republican Senate to make that happen. That was probably the biggest thing. There were a couple of other things as well. Um, actually, you know what, Joan, I probably should mention just one other thing, which is um, that uh, we now have a series of steps and a prohibition on expelling children from preschool. So believe it or not, this has been a thing where little kids, three and four year olds getting kicked out um, uh, from their preschool programs. And this has a disparate impact on, especially our little kids of color, um, that they really are, are treated differently in that way. So we now have a series of steps to go through and a, and a place of saying, you know, the problem with, if you have a problem with a three year old, the problem is probably with you more than with the three year old. We wanna make sure to be supporting that three year old. So we now have this prohibition on, ex, on expulsion of little, little kids. And instead, a lot of supports for that. That's that's the other one I'm super proud of too. Um, and thanks for asking about that. I get pretty passionate when it comes to little kid stuff. Both of those things you mentioned are both so important. Okay, all right, Dave. I'm going to ask my question. And, and you know, I okay. think we all know we're experiencing so many crises right now. We've got the pandemic. We've got the loss 
of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, which has created, sadly, uh, um, a reaction that is, I think, making all of us just, just heartbroken at what's happening and what, what the result might be. Along with that, we've got racism, we've got climate change, we've got the economy, we've got an election on November 3rd. So my question is two-pronged. <clears throat> what can you folks in our, your Minnesota legislature do around some of this, so many things, or what can we as citizens, what you can advise us, what can we or should we be doing? Okay, it's all yours. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I mean, so I, I hope it's clear to all of us now that, that our democracy, that our society really requires all of us to be involved, that it can't be a spectator sport. We all have our roles to play. Some of us are in a position where we're serving in a legislative body and we can vote and all that stuff and our constituents can't, but it still does require all of us to be involved and to be engaged. And there is so much that we can do. Um, and frankly, there's so much that I can't do without the partnership with constituents. So, so a couple, so sort of taking it in out of order. I mean, in terms of things constituents could do, the first step is to just be engaged in and be in relationships. So you all are choosing to spend your late afternoon with me, which is wonderful. And please know if you live in the district, and I think most of you do, um, I want to hear from you. I want to know what you think. Um, I tell when I'm out door knocking, I tell people, you're my boss. Um, you know, you know I mean, please be kind to your employee. I know that you will. Um, but like, I work for you. Like, let's be in touch. So reach out to me and let me know what you think. Um, if you happen not to live in my district, you are on this for some other reason, be in touch with your own legislators. There's no reason. To, yeah, okay, there you go. Um, there's no reason not to have that connection. And so I really want to encourage that. Um, and then, and then get involved in organizations, causes, other things that you care about. It doesn't need to be a big thing. But so often when constituents contact me, they're interested in having this result happen or that result happen. I love to connect them with other people working on those issues too, because that amplifies your voice and amplifies your power and that I can work with you in that way. Um, but I think the biggest thing is just that, just that, that thought that our, um, and I guess, um, and not to be too much of a, to build on your point about being a downer, but um, you know, um, democracies are fragile. Um, societies can be fragile too. They, they can have such, um, such strength and robustness, especially in the relationships between people, but, but, um, but democracies need to be nurtured and that's the work of all of us. And so to have each of us play a role and to view yourself as a democracy participant, as a nurturer, be involved in that, to my mind, that's just absolutely critical. Um, if we get all that right, then getting back to the first half of your question, what can the Minnesota legislature do? There's a ton that we can do. Um, there's just a, a, a lot that we can do. We can, we can have progressive taxation that makes sure that people who are especially benefiting from what's going on in our society, and um, that's wonderful that they are and that they are also paying in to support what's going on as well, making sure to be lifting everybody else up um, and making sure that, that, again, the kids and their families get off to a great start like I've described. Uh, making sure you mentioned uh, climate change um, that we are pushing to be using clean energy sources and moving in that direction. There's so much that can be done in terms of regulation and spending other things. Um, but in order to do that, we have to have a legislature in place that wants to take those steps. And I guess since this is a, this is a campaign event, because you've been inviting me that way, uh, I can feel pretty comfortable saying that, yeah, that means I hope having a Democratic um, Senate as partners and keeping our DFL House and Governor Walls and really moving forward on so much of those things. Um, there's a lot that we can do and it's gonna take a lot of a lot of work and effort and participation in our democracy along the way. So to continue yeah. the conversation, is there anyone else, uh, raise your hand, wave, unmute your mic. Um, is there anyone else who wants to join in the conversation with Dave? Share a question, share a passion of yours. Um, this is a conversation, it's not just a Q and A with Dave. So yes, anyone else? An opinion, yeah. Um, You're my bosses. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mary. Go ahead. Mary Sullivan. Um, I, uh, I know that you're doing um, some registration outreach, uh, and I distributed uh, flyers that our subcommittee for elections put together on Sibley Manor. Um, but do you know what is what kind of outreach um, is being made to assisted living? Uh, centers 
and we've got a fair number just in the neighborhood and people that um, may or may not be registered, uh, maybe recent additions to an assisted living facility and need to get registered. And I know in the past, there's been election judge outreach, but with the pandemic, I don't know that people can be going on site. Do you have any ideas for outreach in those areas in terms of getting uh, or something that might be needed to get information out about registering and the roles and all of that good yeah. stuff? Yeah. Well, Mary, I'm so glad that you've, that you've raised this. Um, uh, so let me think. So you're right. Uh, my campaign is especially focused on the part of our district where there's been lower um, folks have been less uh, represented and lower voter turnout, Sibley Manor on the way to the airport. And we're trying to push connections with apartments. Um, it's challenging. You can't get into those facilities. But I will say we haven't been as focused on assisted living. A challenge, of course, being that you can't physically we can't physically get in there safely have to have a person go in there. I can't go in there safely. Um, and mailing can be tough too. We're gonna to be mailing every apartment in the district uh, with voter registration, early voting information very soon. Um, and I don't know if we're set up to be able to vote, be able to mail to individual residents at assisted living facilities it may not be set up that way. So I wanna look into that, number one. But number two, the postcard that we're mailing, it does occur to me that we can distribute that to assisted living, get, get out to people. So that's just in terms of sort of awareness piece but then I hear you as a second part talking about just the logistics of voting for people in assisted living, kind of what I'm hearing you say. Right. Um, yeah, is that, is, that, that, is that right? That's a concern that you have? Yeah, because in, in looking at the Secretary of State's website, um, it did look like in past years, they've literally had people go out to those facilities and help you know, get the information to people, help them if they needed help. Yeah, um, and I just don't. I'm assuming that's not going to be possible this year, so I don't know what might be replacing it. And I was going to contact their office, but I thought you might have some insight. If yeah, there's anything we can do in terms well, the of that kind of outreach. Yeah, well, so the big push this year, and I just want to say to every single person on this um, on this cast here, um, the big push is to vote early. Mm -hmm. um, Ideally, not a single person listening to my voice will be voting on election day. You can vote by mail and you can vote right. in person early or in county elections. So my thinking is just on assisted living. What that means is, is that it is not too late to, to get an absentee ballot provided and then for the residents to fill it out right there with the staff and not need any election judge coming in. Let's and then, pardon me? Well, the part that I was concerned about is you have to be registered at that site. And you've got, if you send in your um, request for absentee ballot and you're not registered at that address, they'll send you out registration, but then you're bumping into the, forgive me, 21 or 23 days that you have yeah. to be registered before the election. And we're coming up in, well, you know, in well, know three it, weeks or so. Yeah, no, it's, it's when well, it's critical then that, yeah, I mean, if, if somebody's not currently registered at that facility, then they do need to get registered at that facility. That's true. Right. And, that, and, that, and that can be part of the paperwork for applying for the absentee ballot. And I would, I guess I would think that when you fill out the paperwork to get an absentee ballot, you probably at the same time want to fill out the paperwork to register. If, you realize, sure. you, have, yeah, if you realize you have to do that. And I if don't know. Well, right, I'd realize, say if there's any, yeah. that they have to do that and they do their absentee ballot but they did it five days too late. So then they've got yeah. to uh, register. I see a couple hands. Yeah, I see a couple of hands raised, yeah. yeah. What we're doing here at Cronlud Village is I went to the Ramsey County Election Bureau and got, and Marty helped me with this, got a whole stack of absentee ballot applications and registration forms so that there isn't that delay of sending in, sending back, sending in, sending back. Mm -hmm. And so what we have done is if you can, if Mary, if there's somebody that you know at Sibley Manor who could sort of be the contact, the, the point person, they could be they could have those those uh, forms and wow. to be able to be accessible right there instead of having to call in and having them sent. That the it's it's the beginning or the sending and the and the uh, sending back that gets to be the time consumer. 
the the what we did in our outreach is provide the Secretary of State's website, um, and with pretty much confidence that the residents there have um, internet access and a phone to get into um, www wmenvotes.org and handle it that way. I'm more worried about the, the senior getting not only the, um, the absentee ballot, but realizing they have to register because the, the, you know, they've two years ago, they were in their home and now they're in an assisted living facility and it, it never clicked that they needed to get registered and they, they request a ballot and then if you don't, you're not registered and it, it's too late. And so then they'd have to register on election day and they're not gonna be able to get there. It's so, yeah, so is there to, anything we can do, Mary, to support folks, to make it as easy as possible, to get papers in their hands, to do it online, to use phones. We know it's gonna be challenging during COVID. And I see, uh, Callan, you have a, a, a comment or a question you wanna add? Yeah, I was just going to say, I know um, Minnesota voters can register day of. Could that apply to absentee ballots if um, someone can't or if someone doesn't realize they have to register, could they still complete that process on the absentee ballot and be contacted when they turn that ballot in to, to check the details? They either have to be registered 21 days before the election or they can register in person when they go to vote in person. So you've got that period of time, 21 days right. where you, you, my, you can't file an absentee ballot if you're not registered. I guess my, my thinking on any of this is it's kind of, um, I would kind of look to, to, I mean, so Joan in her case, she knows a particular facility. She knows it well, she lives at it, right? And she's determined, she's gonna make sure the people in that facility have what they need. So I would say to Mary or anybody else, we can talk about it as a general matter. We certainly should, but I would just say, Start any of us interested, I mean, I'd say just identify an assisted living facility one and make sure that they're covered and talk to the staff and say, hey, let's figure out who's registered, who's not, let's get it done. If that's, it's kind of like the tossing of the, you know, whatever the starfish back in the sea, like maybe you can't toss them all in, but if you toss in some, everybody, people, I'd say just um, the important thing at this point is identify anybody who's an eligible voter and help make sure they vote. And um okay. And, you know, yeah. I was trying to confirm um, whether or not you were aware of any state outreach that's being done in substitution for what they normally would have done. Yeah, um, I'm not I have to start yeah, I'm not, calling facilities and find out. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not aware personally, but I might not, honestly. I mean, like, there's so much going on. I'm, I'm, I feel like with each of us, we kind of just grab whatever's in front of us and do the best that we can. And uh, so I'd say, yeah, I'd say pick pick one facility to start and, and, and go from there, so. And yep, and, we, and we've got students to think about at St. Kate's as well. And, and during mm -hmm. this time in transition, how do we get students uh, engaged and registered, whether that's at home right. or on campus? Um, so we've got a lot of audiences to engage this year, and, and it's going to be challenging. Anyone else have a comment, question for Dave? Callan, you've got another comment or question? Um. I know Joan mentioned uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and she was someone who I uh, accredit as a huge inspiration and is part of the reason I want to do what I'm going to do. Um, but I just wanted to know, you know what you and the Minnesota legislature uh, can do to really make sure that uh, even if Roe v. Wade uh, and other forms like the birth control bill or um, that was recently struck down by the Supreme Court saying that uh, you uh, moral and religious uh, beliefs can be placed in front of um, uh, birth control insurance. What you and the Minnesota legislature can do to make sure that Minnesotans who need that birth control and need that assistance can get it and get that women's health education. Yeah, thanks for that question. And um, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot that we can do. Um, if Roe v. Wade were to be overturned, it would turn the question back to the states. And, uh, and it'd be all the more important than for Minnesota. And I should say that I, I am somebody who, um, 
who supports um, women being able to to make these really important decisions uh, for themselves with the consultation of their of their um, physician, their family, etc. Um, and uh, and yeah, there then there's a lot that we can do in that way. And I've been supportive of that and making sure um, that uh, that uh, contraception is covered, insurance plans, etc. I want to make sure that folks understand when you made the comment about um, your reference to that Supreme Court case about moral and religious grounds kind of over overriding um, women's health. To be clear, we're really talking about corporations who offer their employees health insurance and then somehow like the corporation having a religious or moral ground, which we don't even think of corporations as having religion. It seems a little weird to me or having moral ground. And then based on that, they can overcome. And it kind of is connected to the idea that people get health insurance through their employer to begin with. So yeah, if you're in a situation where um, our society does not provide health insurance. You only get it through your employer. And now suddenly these really important decisions are being made for you based on the, pers the, the company you happen to work for. And then that company somehow having a religious belief, which again, does not make sense for companies to have that. Um, it just doesn't make any sense. So no, there's actually a lot that we can do. And, and that's been something that's been really important to me. So yeah, thanks. And we'll, we'll be pushing it hard. Dave, I'm wondering, um, you know, given COVID right now and the economic impacts, I mean, we're hearing at least here in St. Paul, you know, the major, major budget cuts that will be going on and um, I'm sure on a state level as well. I'm just curious, you as a candidate, as an individual, how do you stay connected with folks who are directly impacted uh, economically um, by COVID right now and the recession and everything going on, um, knowing that you live a couple blocks from Crondelet Village and St. Kate's here, um, this, this community could be a little more cushioned than some communities of the, the impact. So how do you stay connected with, with uh, what's going on in our state? I mean, I, I certainly try to stay as connected as I can. So, I mean, I'm, I'm getting a lot of, um, of uh, briefings and, and connections with the government agencies. So it's kind of on that side of things. So the, you know, the state of Department of Health and the city of St. Paul, et cetera. Um, I'm trying to be as connected to constituents as I possibly can. I'll be honest, it's a real challenge because the whole nature of the pandemic is that we're not being physically with each other. Um, so on Sunday, uh, we had an event um, that we mentioned, we talked about Sibley Manor and, and having this focus there in West 7th. So I've actually, my campaign is actually paying with some other um, organizations for a full-time organizer in that area to really be making connection. Um, he's um, uh, a young man who's uh, Ethiopian background and speaks um, actually several of the languages spoken by a number of the residents there. Anyway, so um, we were there for a voter registration early vote event on Sunday. And it felt so good to be out and about for a couple of hours, just chatting with constituents, talking with them, engaging with them. But um, it's been very difficult to do that during the pandemic. So what I'm trying to do is to, I was sending out a lot of messages from my office, encouraging people to contact me. I've certainly gotten a lot of emails of people who've been um, struggling and, and, and um, dealing with the situation. I always try to get right back to them, um, but I'm doing my best. And I, I'll certainly encourage you all, if you know people who are struggling or wanna talk or anything, to be in touch with me um, as constituents. Anyone else? Uh, uh, Anise, I see you got your hand raised. This is so simplistic. My apologies. I got into the uh, flow here a little bit late. So if it was asked already, I apologize. I have had such a trouble uh, with getting signs. I want to fill my front yard with more of your signs. I got yours, Dave, God bless you. <laughs> Finding a Tina Smith sign is like golden. Where are they? I've been asking, I've, you know, any of these signs, what is such a tight hole? They should be blanketing the whole, you know, community wide, the state. Can you answer? Yeah, I, 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 I can't. Um, I will, so now we really are getting into the campaign weeds, but I'll just say there's a, there's a, um, there's a entity called the Coordinated Campaign, which connects all these different campaigns. And the joke, well, first of all, you may be familiar with the Will Rogers line from the 1930s, probably. He said, he said I'm not a member of an organized political party. I'm a Democrat. Oh, that's um, cute. Yeah. Um, and mm. the line now is that the Coordinated Campaign, the one thing you know every two years about the Coordinated Campaign is that it will be uncoordinated um, because 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 we're Democrats. Um, so I certainly can't speak for the Smith campaign in terms of the lawn signs or anything. I've been delighted to see the many Biden-Harris signs finally out. 
I do want to confirm. So you do have a pinto sign? Because if yes, you don't, I, I do. Okay, good. Your okay, son, good. I think, delivered it, and to another yeah. friend who's part of the Lumen Christi group. That she's oh, my buddy, and we stay up with each other on this. So she'd take oh. a jillion of these signs too. Anyway, oh, I just oh, as oh. I drive around, I just keep seeing empty yards, and I think I know these people want a sign, but they, yeah, I just yeah. don't know. Uh, okay. I, um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I'm apologizing. Yeah, I, I still, and I won't keep you on this one too long. My ballot finally arrived. Of course, I requested it at prior to the uh, primary. So it arrived today. And I'm telling myself due to a phone call that came in about me, and I'm sorry to be so simplistic, but I expect to talk to others about this. Uh, is it, I was encouraged to go in and do in-person voting. So I, I began to think, you know, I understand the law here and how we are able to turn in our ballots by, you know, absentee ballot and so forth. But is there a deadline by which you would practically say, do not mail it in anymore because it is likely not to get, you know, even with the extension of another few days or even up to seven, I don't recall, for our state to keep be being counted. But what is the deadline by which you would advise we no longer use the mail because there's a good chance it'll get swamped by not uh, being counted? You know, I, I think I'm going to do a little bit of a lawyerly dodge here. Um, okay. And just say that I'd rather I'd rather not have any of us be in that position. So first of all, the reason you only got the ballot today is they only were mailed out on Friday because right, Friday is the right. Okay, so just sort of if you if you were thinking, oh, I should have gotten my ballot before. No, you shouldn't have. They were mailed out Friday. That's the first day of early voting. So that's right. all good. Um, right. And, um, and and just quickly, I, Dave, on that, please, yeah. sorry to cut you off, but no, please. we do know that folks at the village have not received their ballots yet. Just because it was mailed on Friday doesn't mean you have received it yet. So right. uh, we need to give it a couple of days, um, but uh, they were hopefully mailed on Friday or in, in the weekend here, and you'll be getting them in the coming days. Right. Yeah. And I guess, I guess what I would say is this is, um, you know, uh, well, I think what, what our family is going to do, um, I think, is fill it out right away, pop it in the mail. You can track your ballot. So we'll probably right. check in, you know, a week or 10 days and kind of make sure it's in. Um, eventually, you can go in or whatever. Um, but if you still have that ballot, you haven't sent it in and we're getting getting into October, maybe at that point, see how things are going. Maybe you mail it and track it. Maybe you deliver it to the Ramsey County Elections Office. Um, right. But again... <laughs> My preference would be, let's just all just not even worry about it. Let's lock those votes in. And I will tell you, as somebody who's campaigning, the more people who have the checkbox they've already voted, that right. means the more that we can then focus on the people who haven't yet voted right. and turn them out. So right. it's really important. Was there ever any consideration for counting the ballots as they came in? Because I, as I understand it, the absentee ballots don't get counted until the day of the election anyway. They're all kind of in a vault until that day. Why are we not being able to do that ahead? I know there's a law, but. Yeah, I think um, uh, I think that the thinking there is that, you know, you do all the counting. It's just sort of that this principle, I guess, of doing all the counting at the same time, which I know I'm just sort of repeating your question back. I, I'm not familiar about why that was in the first place. and haven't thought about it too much. But um, I will tell you, I think we have pretty much the best election administration in the country. Okay. Um, Secretary of State Simon is extremely good in his team. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, I uh, and we have a very, uh, very good system. We have a system, by the way, that relies on paper ballots and machines. It's very safe. It's very good. Um, so I would say I wouldn't worry too much about any of that. Um, okay. Honestly, what I would say is fill out the ballot, send it back in, and then think about how you can get more people out. Right. to be to be voting too and don't worry about anything else just focus on the thing in front of you and make all it right happen. thank you appreciate it yeah any other comments questions margaret margaret go ahead jump in okay hi dave thanks for for being here today um i had a question about the pandemic can you hear me okay yep okay i had a question about the pandemic and i you know i it keeps looking to me like Governor Waltz at some point may be giving up his emergency powers if we meet the right kind of statistics. And I'm just wondering, what's that going to do for your role in the legislature? What will be your responsibilities if that happens? Yeah, thank you. It's um, uh, This has been a big source of attention and debate every 30 days. And you've probably followed this to make sure other people are aware as well that um, that the way that the law works is that the, for this emergency powers the governor um, took on in March, 
is that once we adjourned, he had to have, he, he has to renew the powers every 30 days. And if we're out of session, then at least how the law has been interpreted is that needs to call us back into session to give us the chance to sort of take away the powers or not. So every 30 days we have this debate and this sort of fight over it. My Republican colleagues are wanting to take it away, but have not really um, been in position, it seems to me, or sort of proposed a real plan as to what they would actually do. Um, I think the answer to your question is probably gonna depend a lot on the exact circumstances about when and how the powers um, go away. Um, there are a part of the reason that many of us have not really wanted to make sure the powers don't go away is that there are these executive orders that, that he has in place that are um, very important in terms of the healthcare response. And so I would expect that uh, the powers wouldn't go away unless either those executive orders could go away and things are at a certain level, or we would need to be in place to right away put laws in to, to address those orders. There's some flexibility in terms of human services and health and various things. Um, so I don't know that it would, um, it's hard to say because it would depend a lot on exactly when it happens. Um, you know, we're already getting to be late September. We've got a few more months to be back in session again. Um, so I guess it, it's, I'm having a little bit hard time kind of um, being able to project forward and know exactly what'll be going on at that time. Dave, I'm wondering, um, you know, the George Floyd killing it has been uh, let's just say, I think a huge turning point, not only for our state, for our nation and for the world. I mean, the protests have gone all around the world. And so I'm wondering, what do you see coming from this event in Minnesota in terms of the legislature, in terms of next year? Um, one of the things I wonder is, is, do you see any hope for something as simple as taking, uh, there is an exception in the Minnesota state constitution for slavery can still exist in, in our constitution. What do you see as possibilities of uh, opportunities coming from the George Floyd killing in the state legislature this next session? Well, the exact path is gonna depend honestly on the election results. Um, so there were some reforms that passed. They were relatively modest, but, but um, but big just in the sense that at least something was enacted, but it really was because my colleagues of color um, were pushing hard, many of us standing with them, but the Republican Senate was um, refused to have hearings on the proposals, refused to, um, to really move on them um, at all. Um, and I, I'll just be honest, and this being a campaign event, I guess I can, I can be, um, be talking this way that, that um, you know, if the Republican Senate stays in place, it's hard for me to see there being a lot of progress um, beyond what's happened. Um, because it's been, there's been a lot of resistance um, that they've had. Um, the challenge that I've seen, I agree with you that um, that, that, uh, that, that murder um, really has the potential to be a big turning point. It really has been in so many ways. Um, I will say that I've noticed on the campaign trail and, and um, as I've been doing my own volunteering for candidates around the state and others, um, I really feel like there's been a lot of, of um, exploitation of that from what I view on the on the right of folks saying, um, oh, we need to be worried about uh, about about uh, you know crime and riots and various things, and not focused on. Which of course, we need to be concerned about those, but not focused on what are the underlying um, conditions that gave rise to all of this. So during the most recent uh, special session of the legislature, where we were supposed to be talking about. Um, the pandemic and about the emergency powers um, per um, Margaret's question. Um, there was a Republican legislator who accidentally sent a note to all the Democratic legislators. It was a, just a whoops kind of a message. And he said, reminder everybody, as we discussed amongst ourselves, among the Republicans, um, we shouldn't talk about COVID and the pandemic. That's not a winning issue. We should talk about public safety. That's how we're gonna win the election. And I've definitely felt that a lot of um, this, of that kind of um, thing. Um, and it's really disheartening to me, to be honest, because I think that, that soon after um, his killing, one thing that happened was this sense of people really recognizing and seeing many of us for the first time, the impact of you know, what it is to be a person of color interacting with so often with law enforcement and not just that institution, but other ones as well. Um, and, um, and it's so important that we hang on to that feeling and that, and that memory, especially those of us who identify as white, to recognize that we don't have that experience. And our friends and our family and those that we love who do have that background do have that experience and we need to support them. 
So um, a lot's going to depend on the election, and then a lot is going to depend on how we all engage with the rhetoric that's happening around the election about kind of what's really going on in, in the country. Anyone else? Oh, I just have a quick question. Hi, Dave. Thanks for hey, this time yeah. with us. And um, uh, just to follow up on Marty's question about hmm, how are you connecting with the community and such during COVID. Yeah. And so um, mentioning, you mentioned you um, have hired a community organizer. Mm -hmm. And is this, uh, is this person, does this person live in Sibley Manor? You know, actually, he does not. Um, he grew up. Uh, he has lots and lots of friends, friends, and has lots of community, lots of personal connections there. He himself uh -huh. does not. Okay, but lots of connections. And so, there. is this somebody that uh, other community organizations, community organizations can organizations uh, would be able to access or partner with on issues that come up in the future? Yeah, I mean, so his his yeah, role sure. is through. Yeah, oh, you may need to hit yeah. mute, or somebody might need to. I'm not sure. Sorry, I'm sort of bouncing around the sound. Okay, that's better. I'm not sure what that was. Um, anyway, so his role is really focused on the through the election, and definitely can oh. connect with people. Yeah. Now after oh. the election, because one thing just to say is like people sometimes think like I've got some massive staff, or there's some massive. Like it's like, you know, it's like. I get uh, many years, I have one third of a legislative assistant. So I get one third of a person who's my assistant of legislature. And that's what I got. Um, so it's not, I don't have like some massive congressional staff. And he had the campaign too. So he's around for the next couple months. But I know his name is Haile um, Tegenye. And, and Haile, I know, will continue to be engaged in this work beyond that. And, and we'll talk. I mean, it may well be that, in fact, we, do, we know it's through the election. And we'll have to talk about after that. Um, and I and I know that he um, he's passionate about this work, and I know would love to talk with you about opportunities to work together and community organizations and otherwise. Yeah. Okay, Dave. So we're going to need a little moment here to help our next question here. So Linda Napier oh. is uh, at the village. Uh, there's a group of four sisters watching it on their TV. So let me just walk them through. Uh, Linda, if you could have them turn down the volume on the TV. Uh, then, then we won't get the echo from the TV. And then you can turn on the microphone on your computer and ask your question to Dave. So if on the computer, on the lower left-hand corner, there's a microphone and you can turn it on. And Linda, you can ask your question of Dave. There you go. Okay, thanks, Marty. Oh, and, and also um, I want to let you know it's coming across really well the sound and the video part. Great. Over at Cranlet Village. Uh, so uh, David, I want to uh, just, it seems like such a concern that there's such a, uh, and, to, and you know, um, antagonism between the metro part of Minnesota and people outside that. And it, it's, uh, as a state, it's not, it's really uh, a problem, it seems like. So is there, um, I mean, not just, anyway, I just wanted to see if you thought there had been any uh, way to keep repairing that divide. It's, it, it's, yeah, thank you for the question. It is so hard. I mean, it, it cause, because let's be clear, it's, it's, oh, you may need to turn down your yep, key. Go. Okay. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> um, the, um, uh, I mean, really, this parallels divides in our country as a whole. Um, it's sort of the Minnesota version of this as a country as a whole. Of course, it's especially distressing because it's our state um, and, and it's our country, too. Um, and I don't um, I don't know. I mean, when I talk to um, I've talked to some uh, folks from greater Minnesota who you know very much feel, um, you know, looked down upon. Um, there's just um, uh, there is this real sense of that, um, and I haven't. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure what we can do. I mean, I, I I can tell you certainly how I try to model my own behavior, both in the legislature and otherwise. Um, and you know, I was talking with some some uh, colleagues who represent Greater Minnesota districts and talking about how you know, for they'll say you know, yeah, I talk to my constituents and say you know, don't you have your your kids and your grandkids live in the metro? And they say, yeah. And they say, okay, well, it's, we're all family, and many of us have grandparents. Um, in greater Minnesota or otherwise, other family members. Um, 
we again it feels like this parallels this division in our country as a whole and i i don't know how else to deal with that except through conversation and engagement um and respectful conversation engagement as much as we possibly can um so i've been making phone calls i said for candidates and having some really interesting conversations with people about what they're thinking and feeling and and trying to have that um <clears throat> but i don't um I, I, don't, I don't know what uh, what we can do about that beyond just try to continue to push and connect as human beings. It's challenging. Yeah. Dave, I have a, a question on, on, the, on the census. Yeah. Um, that is going to be so important for Minnesota, you know, the possibility that we may lose a congressional seat uh, and the fact that the administration has moved up the deadline for that is is it is your office is your campaign doing anything uh, around that during this election season because uh, it's all coming up it, even it before. is yeah i mean i mean joan it, and it's it's just about a perfect storm isn't it that i mean the the day the census day the big day was april 1st which was just about two weeks into the, the state of emergency, et cetera. I mean, just really not a time that you could go around knocking on doors, which is what they're gonna have done. And then of course we have an administration which is very hostile to the census. And as you say, it's cut off by several weeks, the time, the counting period. Um, honestly, our campaign is not focused. So I, I have done some work on my legislative office and on the official side to be pushing this. On the campaign side, we have not done a lot because we've really been focused more on the registering to vote, et cetera, trying to be as helpful as we can. Um, and I know a lot of, we've got a number of volunteers and others who I know have been working with the census effort. Um, but I've mostly been trying to push it on my official side. Um, but it's challenging with so much going on, you know, but I agree with you, it's, it's absolutely critical. It just feels like there's so much that's so critical right now. Um, and I will say, I feel like we were kind of resting kind of I at least kind of was maybe a little bit coasting thinking, you know, our state was number one in the country um, in terms of the number of, of um, census uh, returns. But I believe that we've dropped significantly from that number one position. You may know Joan or somebody else. No, I um, think we're at about, a, well, we're 11th last time I saw. Okay, yeah. We were still at 95% response rate, right, Margaret? I think almost 95% response rate, oh. but I don't know okay. what that translates into people. So that's what I'm trying to yeah. learn. Yeah, it's a big deal. It's a big deal for us. Yeah, totally. So, um, Jackie, have you been doing more with the census? Yeah, our, our committee, we have a little subcommittee on at Lumen and Wonderful. yeah, so, um, but that's the great. challenges are, you know, continue to surface the deadline, the time allowed to collect and, uh, just at um, the federal level, um, um, people hired who probably, well, who had no census experience. So it's just, it's been a challenge. And um, uh, the, I know that the door knockers, which have started August 8th, I believe, um, one of their challenges was um, the apartment complexes and then um homeless people i believe were some other challenges but um and i don't know what the 94 point something percent uh, response rate translates to people so that's what i'm trying to learn i haven't gotten a response on that yeah okay kaylin i see your hand is up um i just wanted to bounce off of the census questions and uh talk about the redistricting that will happen afterwards. I mean, we've seen in Flint, Michigan, the direct ties that can affect, really affect a community if districts are um, drawn to try and win voters and to choose the voters. And um, I know, because I've been watching a lot of debates, so one of the big things is in Minnesota, it's gone to court a couple of different times for redistricting it's too late for like an independent commission kind of ballot, but how, if, if you're reelected next year, what will you do to make sure that you are drawing these districts to be as fair as possible and to make sure that the communities are grouped in ways that make sense so their issues can be heard 
but also so they aren't being uh, minor, um, they're not being pushed into a minority or that they're, they can't express themselves in their uh, democracy. Yeah, no, totally. And, um, and I feel like I've got many, many constituents who are, who are especially focused on this, which is great because it's really fundamental to democracy, right? Um, and it's, it's really not necessarily too late for an independent commission. It is too late for it to be on the ballot, of course, as a constitutional amendment, which would be my preference, I have to say, to just sort of know we have it locked in. Um, we're not necessarily too late for, for to do that independently, but otherwise it's just really important to have principles set out at the beginning of the process that are really clear, like the ones that you say, and then make sure that they're followed. Um, uh, Cause you're right, we do have a history of having the courts draw the lines. They've actually generally, I think, drawn them pretty fairly. Um, so we're not like other states where we have these crazy, crazy districts and thank goodness for that and the way the lines are drawn. Um, but it's important to continue to keep an eye on that. And yeah, I'll be, which I'll be doing. So Dave, I'm kind of wondering, um, as you drive around the Twin Cities, I, I must admit, even as I went for my morning jog this morning, um, I'm seeing homeless people living in parks and all over the place in the Twin Cities. Um, I don't think a week goes by that you see something in the newspaper about the increased number of people who are homeless. Um, the state did a lot to help places like Dorothy Day, uh, the new Dorothy Day place a couple of years ago when we had a bit of a surplus. What in the world are you thinking in terms of uh, the state uh, this coming year and our homeless situation? Yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely critical that we, um, that we make sure that everybody has, I guess I, I link people who are sort of obviously experiencing homelessness, uh, intense, et cetera. But then we know there are so many people who are um, experiencing housing instability, I guess we'd call it, where you know maybe they're sleeping on a couch this night in a car this night. Maybe they're able to be at this place for a couple of days, maybe in a motel even for a, for a night, but then they're gonna be ill. And to not have a stable, safe, affordable place to live. I should maybe note back to Jones, I'm um, bringing up at the very beginning about my work with early childhood. Um, I've been really focused on programs and childcare and other things. But of course, if a family has a stable, safe, affordable place to live, they can deal with a lot of things on their own. You know, they, they, they may not need a lot of various other kinds of help. And on the flip side, if they don't, then it may be that all kinds of good programs are not gonna help much if the family doesn't know where they're gonna be sleeping tonight. Um, so this is really, really important. And uh, yeah, I've been very strongly supportive. There's an agenda called Homes for All or a group called Homes for All. Um, we need a lot more houses, a lot more homes to be built we need more support for rent, et cetera. Um, and, um, and we just need to recognize this as being the critical human need that it is. And um, yeah, I mean, in the short run, I'll say that the, that the state or state legislation is, is, is sort of a blunt instrument. It doesn't work very well when we have, like for, the, for, um, for people living in tents right now, that's where we're really working with the cities and the municipalities trying to help them. But I've been in close touch with the city of St. Paul but we really need then is state action to make sure that there's funding and support for people. So, yeah. Well, Dave, or I should say candidate Dave Pinto, as we come up to the end of our hour, we asked for an hour conversation with you. Um, we know you are a candidate, so we wanted to give you an opportunity at the end of the hour. Um, give us your elevator speech. Why should we vote for Dave Pinto uh, this election cycle? Um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, uh, I hope that you've gotten a sense of my work this past hour, maybe before as well. And I think what I'd like to do more is, so what I'll say is just please be in touch with me, please reach out um, and just know that I want to be in contact with you. But I think what I may do is rather than sort of try to sell you on the idea of, of voting for me, more sell you on the idea of making sure that every eligible person gets a chance to vote this election. And so, and just to say that every concrete step that we can make, if you can identify three people who don't have the support to be voting right now, maybe they're living in assisted living, wherever they are, um, and you can help make that happen, that's absolutely critical. Um, that for me would be the absolute top priority, more than a vote for me, more than a vote for anybody in particular, um, would be to make sure that every single person is voting. Um, Maybe I'll tack on that in connection with that too, that have that especially be true, not just the people who are right around you, but if you have friends and family in other places too, 
Um, we need this all around the state, all around the country. And especially back to the question that was asked about rural versus metro divides and all, the more we can be just engaging and connecting with one another and then recognizing that our democracy is such a precious thing that we all share and we really need to be engaged in it together. That would be my, that'd be my hope and that'd be the thing I would hope I would persuade you about um, today. So thanks. Well, thank you, Dave. On behalf of the Justice Commission of the Sisters of St. Joseph and Consociates and our LAP legislative advocacy partners um, and Crondelet Village, we thank you again, really, from the bottom of our heart for being the first test case as we try and do this on Zoom and engaging uh, residents of Crondelet Village with their televisions. We heard from Linda that it came out loud and clear and for your willingness to help us to record and just find new ways to continue the circle conversations and engage people. We are just so grateful for your uh, openness. And uh, um, as a candidate, thank you for coming and, and sharing in this conversation with us. And I'll just put in a ruthless plug. We have again invited any candidate on the ballot to uh, join us for these conversations. And we send it out to them and we don't know who will accept. We are our next accepted candidate to uh, join us for a circle, circle conversation is Aaron Murphy. Will join us on October the 1st at noon and we're gonna try the same format because I, I think it worked uh, or it worked as well as it can during COVID uh, during this. So if you have any feedback um, on how this went or how we can make it better, both Dave as a candidate or you as participants, please email myself or Joan and let us know. But um, again, thank you, Dave. Um, and thank each and every one of you for joining us today. We're just so grateful. We, we have found ways to stay connected and continue uh, civic engagement um, together. Thanks everybody, be in touch, please. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Margie and Joan and Dave.